Welcome to week four of Compass Church Mixtape. This week, I've selected an old Merle Haggard song, Rainbow Stew. Listen in and see what I've got to say. So uh, this song, the reason I picked this song is it speaks to a way of thinking that many times it's easy for us to fall into a certain way of thinking. And that is that, okay, we recognize that the world is messed up right now, but there are some things that someone else could do that would turn this around and suddenly life would be better. Things would be going so much better if... These things were changed. Of course, Merle talks about uh, the price of life's got to come down, and, and uh, if we get rid of war, and if we can get renewable energy, then, man, it's free bubble up and rainbow stew for everybody. Now, let me identify some terms here. Bubble up is a, uh, it's an, it's a seven up knockoff uh, down south. It's, just, it's a soft drink. And then rainbow stew is just an idea that he came up with as, uh, you know, here's another really old, old song. It's even older than this one. Remember, sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, everything that's right because you're here in my life, whatever. That's kind of the idea that if, if, you know, right now things stink, but if somebody will make those changes for us, then life will just level out and it'll be great forever. How many know that that's not going to happen? Hate to burst your bubble, but, uh, but we, we fall into that way of thinking. I have to fight that sometimes. I think, well, I would do this, but man, this is, you know, this is this way, and until that's better, then there's, you know, why even try doing anything? But, it all, but when we do that, when we say, well, things are, are crummy right now, and so I'm not going to do anything, we miss out on a lot of great opportunities. We miss out on chances to seize those opportunities that are before us right now. And even worse, we fail to recognize the good things that are happening right around us, even right now, while things seem to be so messed up. But you know, it really comes down to a matter of mindset. You tend to find the things that you're looking for. Have you noticed that? That well, here's a story to illustrate that. Back in the day, back before internet, uh, you know, before you know, a, a lot of things, people got from town to town, mostly riding public buses from town to town. And in small towns and rural communities, the bus station was a place where maybe you could hear some news of what was going on in other areas. They were happening in, in the bigger world because people would be getting on a bus to go off to another town People would be getting off the bus coming from another place, and they would have news of what was happening in other communities. Well, in this particular small town, there was an old man that would be there at the bus station each morning and afternoon. There were two buses that passed through town, a morning bus and an afternoon bus, and he would be there on a park bench sitting in front of the bus station to greet the buses when they came in. Because he wanted to visit either with the people that were getting ready to leave to find out what kind of adventure they were going on, or he wanted to visit with the ones that were getting off the bus to see what they knew about what was happening in the town they just came from. So one morning, he was there waiting for the morning bus, and uh, the bus pulled up, and people got off, and there was a young man that he didn't know. The young man got off the bus carrying a suitcase. So he engaged the young man in a conversation, found out his name, found out a little bit about him, and they said, well, what, what brings you to our town today? And the young man said, well, I'm needing to relocate, and I'm wondering if this might be a good town for me to live in. What can you tell me about it? Well, the old man said, well, before I tell you anything, tell me about the town that you used to live in. He said, oh, it was a great town. He said, I loved the, the, the place. He said, the, the city was just so nice. And the people there were so friendly, the businesses were friendly, the churches were friendly, even the bank was friendly. And he said, it was just, it was so nice, and he said, I really hated to leave. And so the old man said, well, you're in luck. I think you're going to find 
that this is that kind of town. I think you're going to find that we do things really well here. I think you're going to find that people are friendly. I think you're going to find that it's easy to make friends. And you're going to enjoy doing business at these local businesses. I think this is a great place for you to settle down. So the young man went on into town. Well, then he was back. for the, the, the old man came back to watch the afternoon bus come in. And sure enough, on that bus, another young man that he didn't know came off carrying a suitcase. And he engaged that young man in conversation and finally asked him, well, what brings you to our town today? He says, well, I've got to relocate. Is this a town that I ought to move to? And the old man said to him again, said, well, why don't you tell me about the town you just came from? He said, it was awful. He said, that, that was the worst town ever. He said, the government was messed up. The people were messed up. They were so unfriendly. The businesses were rude. You just, oh, it was awful. I hated there. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. So the old man looked at him and said, well, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to find those same kind of people here. You're going to find that our folks are rude and unfriendly. You're going to find that it's hard to get established here. Maybe you should look for another town. Well, the old man was talking about the same people. He was talking about the very same town, but he knew that the first young man was looking for things to love about a town. The second young man was looking for what he could hate about a town. And you find what you are looking for. If you're looking for things to be displeased with or an excuse to, to drop out and do nothing, uh, you're going to find it. Whether it's in your home, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your church, whether it's where you work, whether it's in the news, if you're looking for something to be offended by or displeased by, you are absolutely going to find it. But you can also be in that same marriage, in that same family, in that same job, in that same church, in that same government, and if you're looking for things to be pleased about, guess what? You'll find those as well. Because it's all in the way you choose to view the world. Whatever way you choose to view the world will find support. Because the world will validate your worldview. You know, the news articles that you read, the social media that you participate in, uh, the, the conversations that you have, over time will lead you to a certain mindset. You'll find friends that agree with you. You'll find websites that agree with you. You'll find conversations that agree with you. And it's just a very natural human thing to want to gravitate to talking to people and hearing things that you agree with. Now, there's even a term for that. It's called confirmation bias. And what that means is, is that if you hear something you think you agree with, you start out with the assumption, okay, this is accurate, this is fair, this is truthful. But if you hear something that you are pretty sure you don't agree with, you start with the assumption of, well, this is fake, or this is fraudulent, or this is, you know, this is awful. And if we're not careful, it's so easy to fall into this trap of thinking, well, everybody I talk to and everything that I read and everything that I hear agrees with me, so I have got to be right. And I can't listen to anybody that thinks any differently than I do because they've either got to be stupid or they've got to be evil. They can't just have seen the same things and come to a different conclusion. And that's a dangerous place to be. You know, there are algorithms on the, on the Internet that actually push content to you that, that is the kind that you want to see. The more that you watch certain types of things, the more it pushes to you. It wants to confirm, it wants to validate your worldview. And that is so dangerous to get to that place to where you believe that every voice you're hearing is agreeing with you, and so you are absolutely right. Because there is a world out there that needs to hear a message of hope from Christians. 
that needs to hear about the love of Jesus Christ, how he came to this earth, how he lived a perfect sinless life, how he died for our sins, and how he rose again to, uh, to promise us eternal life if we would accept his offer of grace and let him be the Lord of our life. But when we are shutting people out completely because they don't agree with our worldview, we're missing out on actually the great command, which is to... Yeah, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and show him how you much you love him by how you love others, how you treat others. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done because the more narrow we get our view, the more people we add to our enemies list. And the more people that we not only won't listen to, we won't talk to. And it's easy to drop our, our you know, just drop out and, and stay isolated in our little uh, echo chamber waiting for things to change in a way that we want them to change. So what do we do? How do we get past this? How do we stop waiting for the free bubble up and rainbow stew so that we can enjoy life again? Well, it all begins with the heart. Because the things that you fill your mind with, the things are, they, are, they get stored in your heart. Actually, in, uh, the, the Bible refers to that as the, the, the treasury, the treasury of your heart. Those things get stored there, and then when things happen to you in life, the heart, with what you have stored in your heart, then determines how you're going to react, how you're going to come out from there. And uh, so the Gospel of Luke, really, it, it tells us where the good thing, where the things that we say and think, where they originate. And uh, Luke 6.45 says, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Now, a treasury is a storehouse of assets that we have deemed as being very important, valuable. You don't put junk in a treasury. No, you put treasures in a treasury. So we protect the things that are in the, the, the treasury of our heart. And uh, what you store in your heart determines what you will focus on and the kind of person that you will come. That's why Proverbs 4.23 tells us that we should guard our heart. Because everything that we do flows out of it. Now, so how do we know if the things that we have stored are good or evil? How do we know if we have a good heart or an evil heart? First John gives us a clue. It says, our actions will show what we, that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. So we are to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Find a lot of those here in church. And then we need to love one another just as he commanded us. And what was the command? To love our neighbor as we want to be loved ourselves. And those who obey that command remain in fellowship with God and he with them and we know he lives in us because we have his spirit in us. So what is the spirit that he gave us? What does it do for us? Well, we find that in Galatians chapter 5. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So if those are the kind of things that are coming out, if that is your reaction when things shake you, when, when uh, you come against something that is not in line with maybe what you would like to see happen, if these kinds of things come out of you, then you know that the Spirit of God is living in you. Because it's possible to fake those things for a while. 
You can act nice to certain people. You can be faithful to certain situations. You can be long-suffering in certain places. But when things go south on you, that's when you find what is really in the storehouse of your heart. And that's what comes out. Because it is in times of trouble that we find out what is really in the treasury of our heart. Now, what I love about this, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the the letter to, to the Galatians, was in prison while he was writing this. He was in prison for sharing the gospel. And he was thrown in prison and was there pretty much under custody for the rest, the remainder of his life. So he was a long ways from having any hope of any free bubble up or rainbow stew. Things were not going to be leveling out for him anytime soon. He was going to be in prison. But he wasn't calling for revolution. He wasn't calling for resistance. He wasn't even pleading for his release because he knew that Jesus is the hope of the world. And he wanted to represent Jesus in a way that would bring people in, not drive them away. So he didn't say that, all right, when this corrupt government finally lets me out, then I'm going to be writing lots of stuff to help a lot of people. No. While he was in prison, while he was suffering, while he saw no hope of any free bubble up or rainbow stew, he was writing these letters of instruction and encouragement to the early day church. Even while he was going through that terrible time. He willingly gave up his individual rights in order to carry out the the command to love our neighbor as ourselves. He wanted the world to see how much more value he placed on his relationship with Jesus than he did in his status as a citizen of Rome. Because, you know, the whole idea of of being a Christ follower and this whole whole concept of being a, a citizen of heaven really is seen as revolutionary to insecure political leaders. I grew up during the age of the, of the Cold War and uh, the communist dictatorship of Eastern Europe uh, were, were great enemies and that was uh, dominated the news at that time. And the country of Romania was one of the Iron Curtain countries. And for years they had a, a, a communist dictator by the name of Nicolae Ceausescu who was a, an evil, horrible dictator. And he had arrested a, a, a prominent pastor in Romania, Nicolae Ionescu, and threw him in jail for being subversive. Now, the subversive message that Ionescu was, was preaching was that telling the people, don't be threatened by what the government's doing. You're citizens of heaven. Regardless of what the, the government does to you, you are still citizens of heaven. You still have eternal life waiting for you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so that was, you know, if they're telling him not to be scared of the government, then they couldn't have that, so they threw him in prison. And he was there for many years, underwent uh, horrible torture. And one day, they, were, they had tortured him, and then they put him down on his knees, put a pistol to the back of his head, because they wanted him to turn his back on Christ. They wanted him to deny, his, deny Christ and let it be announced to the world that he was just didn't believe it. They said, if if you'll deny Christ, we'll let you out. We won't bother you anymore for the rest of your life. You can live a peaceful life if you'll just deny Christ. But he wouldn't do it. And so one day they they put him on his knees and they put a pistol to the back of his head and they said, all right, deny Christ right now or we're putting a bullet through your brain. It's just going to be over right now. And I love what he said. He said, the worst thing that you can do to me is to kill me. But the worst thing that I can do to you is to die. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, if you kill me, then the people in my church that I've been proclaiming the gospel to, the people that have been hearing me talk about my faith in God will know that I believed it to the point I was willing to accept death before I would turn away from it. They'll know without doubt that I believed it, and they will believe it as well, and you'll have a lot more than me to worry about at that point. So the worst thing that I can do to you is to die. Do what you need to do. Well, they said, well, you're just crazy. (laughs) They sent him back to his cell. A few years later, he was able to to get out of prison where he was able to, to tell his story. Now, he was in a terrible situation, but he knew who he was in Christ. He was confident 
and his relationship with Christ so he was able to endure faithfully once again with no hope of any free bubble up. No rainbow stew on the menu for him. Because when the treasury of your heart is filled with the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, you don't have to wait for the right situation, the right legislation, the right candidate, the right Supreme Court justice to get into place, the right spouse, the right house, the right job. None of those things will hold you back from being able to go forward helping people through your relationship with Jesus Christ. Joy and satisfaction is right in front of you right now if you choose to see it. But you say, Randy, man, I just don't see it. Things are so messed up. Well, here's how you find it. First, you survive by protecting your humanity. Victor Frankl was a, a Jewish psychologist who was... Uh, uh, a prisoner in, in a Nazi uh, concentration camp during the, the time of the Holocaust. His wife, their infant child, his mother, his father, his brother, all died in the concentration camps. He alone, out of his family, survived. Um, he was still alive when the camps were liberated. He, you know, the only one out of his family. And he wrote a book... Uh, about his experience, and in it he said that what he, what he observed while he was in the concentration camp is that the people who truly survived, not just the people who were just still alive at the time of the liberation, but the people who survived were able to go on with their life, were able to, to, to rebuild their life and enjoy life even after that, were the people who, who protected their humanity by continuing to serve others even in the midst of their difficult situation. He talked about how little food that they were given, but there were people that would share the little tiny bit of food that they had with someone who was nearer to death than they were to try to help them. He said that there were, there were some that isolated themselves. They went into self-protection mode, and then they would do everything that they could do to make sure that I got mine whether you got yours or not. That some of those, many of those died in the camp. He said, but some of those that lived to the end of that occupation suffered from severe depression, and many of them committed suicide later because of the guilt that they experienced by giving up their humanity. So none of us are in a concentration camp, but we can give up our humanity by taking away the humanity of others. When there are people that we disagree with and there are people that believe differently than we do or come to different conclusions than we do, even if those things that they do are very abhorrent to us, if we reduce them to just a name, reduce them to those whatever political group or those ethnic group or those whatever, and then we wish bad for them, we're sacrificing our humanity. Because we need to recognize that every human being is created in the image of God. God loves each of them just as much as he loves us. Even those that have the most abhorrent ideas. And the only way to win them, because they're, God said, is that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we, they come to repentance by finding somebody who knows Christ and is willing to share with them from love, not to try to put them away in anger. It's so tempting in the time, situations of chaos just to call time out and retreat into just taking care of me and mine. But what happens when you do that? More and more people get added to your outside list. Fewer and fewer are on your inside list. So when things look dark, look for ways to help others. Protect your humanity. Listen to others, care for others, especially those who don't look or think like you. It will protect your humanity, and you will be the better for it. Second, don't under-celebrate what the Lord has done. When we first started hearing about this coronavirus, many of us pastors were praying, Lord, keep it away from the United States. Well, it came here anyway. 
And then a lot of us here in Oklahoma are saying, Lord, keep it away from Oklahoma. Well, it got here. <laughs> and then there were a lot of us that were praying, Lord, let it be over by Easter. Well, it's still here, isn't it? Um, so you could, the, the skeptic might draw the conclusion, well, God is either angry, vindictive, mean, whatever term you want to use, or you could say, well, he's completely powerless, or he could do something about it. Because if you only look at things through the lens of how you want to see them end, then you're going to be disappointed a lot. But I choose to look at it in this way. Okay, this has awakened our nation that we can't control everything that's going on. And maybe this is the best time that we have ever had as Christians to show this light, to show this love, to show this compassion to a world that is now finally ready to listen to us. This could be the best opportunity we've ever had in our life. Let's not waste it. Let's celebrate what God is doing. Let me encourage you, look for things to celebrate every day, every moment of every day. Let's get some examples. Okay, if you slept good last night, thank God for it. That's a blessing. <laughs> if you have a house that has an air conditioner that works this week, celebrate that. That's awesome. If you had a donut back there that somebody else went to the donut shop and picked up and someone served to you this morning, celebrate. That's a blessing. And if you start looking for things to celebrate, things to praise God about, it's amazing what it does for every part of your life. You become a person that people want to be around. They don't kind of do this when they see you coming because you are a person that is lifting them up. You're a person that's building them up. You're a person that's celebrating. You're a person that lives with joy because of what you see. This attitude of gratitude is such a wonderful, life-giving thing to you and to the people around you. If you want tensions to lessen in your home, be a person who celebrates. If you want things to work out smoother at work, be a person that celebrates. If you want your church to appear better, be a person who celebrates. Don't under, don't under celebrate what the Lord has done. If you look for blessings, you're sure to find them. And then third, keep doing your best and your best will get better. Now, back in 1980, I was a 23-year-old young man, had thick red wavy hair. Oh, it was so nice. <laughs> Been married about two years, and uh, I had an opportunity, a job opportunity, a, 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 my first true career opportunity with a, with a large oil field service company. And so they... Um, they hired me. I didn't know anything about the business, but they said, we'll train you. Okay. So I start to work, and they get me signed up for these schools. There are in, like there's six of them that I was supposed to go to down in Houston, lasting a week and a half to two weeks apiece. And before I go to the first one, my manager said, Randy, these schools really have a great amount to do with the kind of future you have with our company. It's important that you do well in these classes if you want to have a future here in the company. This course was um, multi -shot, er, magnetic multi-shot subsurface surveying. It was a thrill a minute. Um, but he said uh, this class is really important, and there's a lot of trigonometry in it. Yeah, and I've never been a good math student. I don't do. I can't do figures in my head. I mean, I have to. Right, and I thank God every day for calculators. Um, I know the importance of math. I just have never been able to connect the dots in my head. But uh, I went to the school. Of course, before I left, I told Carol, I said, man, it's really important that I do good. And they've hit me in my weakest place is math. And so we prayed before I left. Lord, we feel like you gave us this opportunity. Help me to understand what's being taught. Help me to grasp it so that I can take full advantage of this opportunity. All right, so I get there, and I'm, I'm hoping that as I get there that I've got some special, you know, spirit in me 
that makes all this makes sense as soon as I hear it. Well, the first day of class, they introduce all these terms, all these formulas, all these diagrams, sines and cosines and tangents and, and all this stuff. And I'm taking all these notes, and, and it is just a jumble of words. I can't make head or tails out of it. And I got to my hotel room that night, and I sit down there, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I can get this. The, all this, what are all these, this, all, all this stuff's been thrown at me at once and I don't get it. And then there was a knock on my door. And there was Hiro. He was another young man in the class. So I think there was eight of us in that class, I think. And um, he was from Colombia, South America. He was in the same boat that I was. They hired him. He saw it as a great opportunity. Uh, he didn't know. He's there to learn like I was. But Hiro's first language was not English. He spoke good enough English but he not only was learning all these new terms, he was having to translate all this in his mind while he's figuring out what these terms mean. He was having a really tough time. He said, Randy, would you help me study? I, I, don't, I, I don't think I'm going to get this. My first inclination is, dude, <laughs> you got the wrong one here, man. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't figure out how to say that and not look like a real jerk. So I said, yeah, come on in, Hiro. <laughs> but I found out as I began to just recite to him the things that I had written down and read these things to him, and we started talking about it, suddenly the dots started connecting. Suddenly things started adding up. And, okay, oh, oh, when they say this, this means this. Oh, okay. And so then every night he would come to my room and we would spend two or three hours going over what we had learned. And suddenly this all made perfect sense to me. And when at the end of the class, I had the highest grade in the class. And what it did is it helped me then to, uh, to, to move forward. Uh, God gave me opportunities I could never have dreamed of, including this one right here, standing in front of you this morning sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with you. And I wondered at various times, what if I'd have told my manager, you know what, I'm not real big on school and I don't like math. Thanks, I'll do something else. How would my life have been different? Or if I'd have told Hiro, you're on your own, dude. I got to figure this out for myself. Good luck with that. No, because it was through I was asking the Lord to help me to understand, and the way that he gave me to understand was by explaining it to someone who knew less about it than I did, and I didn't know much. I did what I could do in that moment, and God bless. Because here's the key truth this morning. Do what you can where you are with the skill that you have, and God will provide the opportunity. Now, Maybe you're here this morning and you've had big ideas, big visions of things that you want to do. And you never have gotten started because you haven't seen an opportunity that looks big enough for you. I know guys that go through Bible school and they're convinced that they're going to pastor a mega church. And so they turn down opportunities at smaller churches. Nope, I'm waiting for my grand opportunity. Do what you can where you are with what you know and let God bless that are you waiting for free bubble up and rainbow stew before you get started well there's really no excuse for not doing anything um, there's something that each of us can do today to fulfill this great commandment there's someone that we can love like ourselves. maybe it's as small as Helping a guy from Columbia figure out what measured depth versus true vertical depth means. <laughs> but there's no right time. There's no right opportunity to start serving and giving. There's just now. Carol and I have a, a running joke. And we say, man, life is just about, about two months away from just completely leveling out and being easy. And we've been saying that for more than 20 years now. 
Because I got news for you. There is no free bubble up. There is no rainbow stick. But there is opportunity in front of you right now. There is blessing waiting you if you will take the opportunities that lay in front of you this morning, if you'll get started today doing the things that you know God would have you do, it'll make a remarkable difference in your life. All right, as I bring this to a close, maybe you're here this morning and you have never received Christ as your Savior. You don't have this store, this treasury of good because you don't have that relationship with Christ yet. Well, you can do that this morning. When I'm praying this concluding prayer, you can say, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are worthy to be the Lord of my life. Come in and take control of my life. And let me live for you. Scripture tells us that he is faithful and he is just. He will forgive your sins. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he'll put you on that path. Or maybe you're here this morning, you're a believer. But you recognize this morning that you have allowed things into the treasury of your heart that shouldn't be there. That they don't reflect the Holy, what the Holy Spirit would like to do in your life. Well, this morning, you can choose what you will dwell on. You can choose what you allow into the treasury of your heart. And you can pray, Lord, help me to move out the things that come from the storehouse of an evil heart and fill my heart with the things that come from the storehouse of a good heart. Or maybe you're one that's just been waiting for the right opportunity to get started doing something. You say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do this you know, when this happens, when, when, when we get the free bubble up and the rainbow stew. But you realize this morning, you need to get started where you are with what you know, doing what you can do today. What is there that you could do right now with the skill that you have and believe that God will bless it? I hope you enjoyed this message today. If you'd like to know more about Compass Church, you can find our website at compasspeople.church. If you'd like to contact us, send an email to info at compasspeople.church. Come in again next week for week five of Compass Church Mixtape.